Mm, certainly. So no, no, no shortage in, uh, in benefits from, from this chemistry. And that, now we can go back to where, where you were, uh, you were leading us previously. So what, what are the challenges, right? Why, why hasn't, why hasn't this been done in the past? Why isn't, why isn't every vehicle have lithium sulfur? And, and what are the main hurdles that we need to uh, overcome here? Right. Yeah. And that's the one that everybody that's a skeptic like me should be asking, right? Is like, yeah. you know, it's got all the promise. What's the, what's the catch, right? Well, I mean, people have been looking at lithium sulfur for a while. It's nothing new. I, I looked at it a little bit in grad school and certainly people, I was at, uh, in a lab there at Oak Ridge National Lab where people have been looking at it for much longer than, than me. So, I mean, it's, it, the challenges are, as I see them, threefold, or there's three major challenges. Um, one of them is that, you know, with sulfur, you get a very, very high uh, capacity. It's got, you know, 600, 1,670 milliamp hours per gram, something like that, whereas something like you know, your uh, NMC is around 150 milliamp hours per gram. So you can see right away that material stores a lot more energy. But in a cell design, when you're building these all up, you need something that pairs well with that kind of, of a cathode material. And if you look at an anode material like a graphite, which, uh, which is what we use for a lithium ion battery, you're getting something like 378 milliamp hours per gram. And that's, you know, that's okay when you're balancing against the 150 of, uh, of the NMC, but you put that against the sulfur and it doesn't really work. You need to have something that's very high energy density on the anode as well to make a better cell. Um, that, you know, generally that will steer you towards something like a lithium metal, and that comes with its own challenges, right? So the ones everybody knows of, right? The energy, uh, dendrite formation, pinholing, um, being able to make sure you have the right purity of that, that uh, material, and all those are engineering challenges that come, that can certainly be overcome. It's, it's something that the solid state, you know, industry is looking at right now. So it's, it's not an over insurmountable challenge, but it is a major one to make sure that you have a safe and reliable anode that is compatible with your electrolytes that is, uh, you know, capable of doing the high rate performance that you need without degrading uh, necessarily. Um, so that's one. The other one is really related specifically to the sulfur, uh, the other two. Uh, the first one's relatively straightforward, and that is um, sulfur is very insulating. So it's not a, it doesn't have good electrical conductivity, and that means that you have to have something else with it. You can't just take a big chunk of sulfur and expect it to cycle. Uh, at best, you would interact with the surface of it. What you have to do is have it highly distributed on some kind of like conductive scaffold. So if you look at any of the literature, you know, the, the modern status of, of lithium sulfur is that they'll put it into carbon nanofibers or they'll put it into buckyballs or they'll put it into, you know, some kind of exfoliated graphite or something like that. There's, there's always some kind of conductive uh, substrate that's gonna allow the sulfur to interact with both the lithium ion from the electrolyte and some electron so that you can get that reaction and that's basically what you know stores and releases your energy. Um, that's the challenge. That's one challenge. And the key there is that you need a material that is going to have the right properties, both surface area, conductivity, um, and stability. That you can highly distribute that sulfur in a very thin way, uh, very regularly, very repeatedly, and get a lot of sulfur uh, distributed in a small amount of space. Uh, and that's the key. So. Sulfur is very insulating, as I mentioned, so you, you can only get so thick before it just cuts off electrical conductivity. So having a highly engineered material in the cathode is critical to that. And that's, you know, that, that comes into the core of where Lighten comes in and, and has this engineered, um, you know, uh, mesoporous type of, of carbon that's based on our 3D graphene. Uh, and then, of course, we take that graphene and build it up to, uh, even from there, we control the pore structure down from, you know, the, the mesopore level to the macro pore level. And um, you know, so you have this kind of hierarchy of um, of pore structures that allow you to get uh, what, you know what we deem what we call a polysulfide caging. Um, so, and that's the third one. So, uh, but you know, so we build up a structure that's highly conductive and able to put a lot of sulfur and get high utilization of that sulfur. The uh, the last one there is this polysulfide caging, and this comes down to the core aspects of what lithium sulfur does. So, unlike a lithium ion battery, where you have an intercalation process, which means that I've got a, um, you can think of it like a, a you know, a, a cubby, right? So you've, you've got a bunch of cubbies that uh, have slots in them, and that's kind of what the cathode and uh, NMC is like. There's channels, lithium will go into those channels, and it will move in, and it'll get with a, an electron, and it'll stabilize between that crystal, those holes in that crystal structure. Um, the, in the case of something like a lithium sulfur, it doesn't do that. What it does is much more of a conversion reaction. So the sulfur, which exists as an S8 ring or octasulfur, uh, will react with the lithium and it'll create what are called polysulfides. So 
sulfur itself is a solid in the electrolyte and at the temperatures that we're looking at, you know, for normal operation with battery. So it sits on that graphite uh, or that, sorry, that uh, carbon substrate that we have. When it reacts with the lithium, it becomes the uh, Li2S8 and it becomes soluble in the electrolyte. So once it becomes soluble in the electrolyte, it has the opportunity to float through the cell. And uh, if you don't control that, what it'll do is it'll ultimately, it'll float into the electrolyte, go across the separator and go to the anode where it'll react with whatever you know, anode material you have, be it a lithium metal or some other kind of thing. And it'll do one of two things. It'll either uh, you know, react and then do an exchange, uh, you know, a redox reaction and then float back to the cathode, react again and just kind of go back and forth. And that's called a polysulfide shuttle which can result in you know, this, this phenomenon called infinite charge. So if you're charging it up, it just doesn't charge anymore because you've got these polysulfides cycling between the two. So that doesn't help, right? That cuts down coolant efficiency. It makes it, uh, it's a big challenge. Uh, the other part of it is that when it goes to the anode surface, it can also re react and degrade and then react with, with whatever that surface is, cause a formation of a surface electrolyte interface that is not favorable. Um, you know, the SEI layer is what you, you're going to have at any kind of interface there to an, uh, an electrode. But if you, you deposit the wrong kind of chemicals in the wrong kind of, in the wrong kind of way, it can become insulating. That drives up your impedance of your cell, which means that you get less power out. It starts to perform worse. And that, that happens, it increases over time. And it happens the same type of thing, you know, in SEI formation happens in lithium ion, but you don't have the polysulfides. So what's critical is you control the polysulfides. And that's where I think most people have not been able to be successful is that you need a way to, you know, if you're going to use a liquid electrolyte, you want the, the polysulfides in the, the solution or the electrolyte because that enables you to get the kinetics you want. It enables you to get, uh, you know, to pull them off the surface as sulfur and then go through the polysulfide series and come down back on the surface as Li2S and get that full range of energy um, that, you know, you get that 16, 70 million amp hours per gram. But you also need to keep them in the place. And that's the other kind of the trick, right, is to, we need to keep these polysulfides going, but we want to keep them very localized. And that's why something like a, the, the cathode material we've engineered at Lighten is, is intended to do exactly that, is it to have a, a combination of mechanical and chemical caging structures or interactions that allow that those polysulfides to stay where they are and you know, not interact with, you know, the rest of the, the bulk electrolyte or the anode. And uh, when you can do that and you control the redeposition well, then you basically are able to take full advantage of that system. Um, and of course, we coupled this with, you know, a whole litany of other things with, of, you know, proprietary and, and, you know, common, you know, best practice type things within the cell to make sure that um, those polysulfides are well controlled and that you are, you know, you're not having degradation of your electrolyte or you're not having any kind of contaminations and stuff like that. So, but that's the, those are the three core challenges, right, is stability of your anode, uh, conductivity of the sulfur, and then your lithium polysulfides. Um, there's a couple minor ones that go in there, but if you can solve those, then you have a very successful and very promising battery. And that's, that's where I think that, you know, Lighten has, has done a really good job of coming up with uh, some innovative stuff to, to move that forward.